We've spent a great deal of time in the past few weeks examining America's changing religious landscape from a number of perspectives. Using the recent Pew poll showing continued growth in the number of religiously unaffiliated Americans as our springboard, we've talked about what these changes mean for churches, culture, and government. This week, I want to look at an even bigger picture where much of that religiosity came from in the first place. And the inspiration for doing that is a remarkable new book titled One Nation Under God, a meticulously researched and annotated history of the conscious, deliberate campaign to reimagine an America dedicated to a Christian supreme being. It's the work of Dr. Kevin Cruz of Princeton University, and I am pleased now to have the author joining us. Uh, Kevin, welcome to State of Belief Radio. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I think one of the hardest things to do is to boil down a comprehensive work like your book into a radio interview that does justice to your book. But we got to try. So uh, would you start, please, by describing the most important facts that you're representing, presenting in this book? Well, sure. And and again, you know, maybe we'll just we'll, we'll scratch the surface here, and, and hopefully if people are interested, they can, they can go read the full book. Right. Um, but, but I think the, the broad strokes would be um, uh, maybe two main points. One, uh, many of the things that we take for granted when we think about America uh, as being a, a, either a Christian nation or, a, or just a religious nation in general are, in fact, a fairly recent creation. They don't mm-hmm. come to us from the founders. Uh, they come from um, perhaps uh, the generation of our, our grandparents or our parents. So things like uh, phrases like one nation under God or mm-hmm. in God we trust. Uh, traditions like uh, the National Day of Prayer or the National Prayer Breakfast and so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of the uh, uh, religious uh, slogans and ceremonies that inflect our national politics and our government, uh, these are creations of really the 1950s. Mm. Uh, And the second takeaway point I I think I would like to make would be uh, that um, the story that I had traditionally heard about when these things uh, had been created was one that really put them in the framework of the Cold War. Uh, that America, uh, in the midst of fighting the godless communists of the Soviet Union, uh, that was when and why uh, we embraced uh, all these uh, religious uh, uh, slogans in our national politics. But what I found in the book is that the story actually goes back a little bit further, uh, and it's really, uh, if we look at the motivation of the men, the movement who created these uh, these uh, um, trappings of religious nationalism, uh, they were really concerned uh, not about foreign politics in the 1950s, <laughs> But domestic politics of the 1930s, they were worried not about the, the Soviet Union, uh, they were fighting the New Deal. Kevin, uh, I know you're a historian, and, and so I have to ask you, when you committed yourself to writing this book, um, how much did you know about what it was eventually going to turn into? Did you have a hunch, or did you already have enough facts in mind to say this is a story that needs to be told? I- I'm just curious how you got into it. That's a great question. Uh, I-, I honestly, I-, I stumbled my way into it. Uh, the-, the book I wound up writing is, is one I didn't even know um, uh, was-, was possible. Hmm. Uh, when I started writing this, it was going to be a grassroots study of about a-, a dozen communities that wound up making up the moral majority. And I was going to look at them at the local level mm-hmm. uh, in the 60s and the 70s to see, you know, what happened. And it's kind of a prehistory of the moral majority. What was going on at the grassroots in the lives of ordinary religious conservatives? Mm-hmm. Uh, but as I started to research that, one of the, uh, the first places I went, because the story I thought was going to begin with a fight over school prayer, I went to the mm-hmm. papers uh, of several Supreme Court justices, and in the papers of Justice Hugo Black, who wrote the 1962 decision, uh, Engel v. Vitale, which struck mm-hmm. down um, state-mandated programs of school prayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, in these papers, I found ten giant boxes filled with angry letters that had been sent into Justice mm-hmm. Black, and I was struck that uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of these letters invoked phrases like "One Nation Under God" and "In God We Trust" mm-hmm. to tell Hugo Black that he had misread the First Amendment, mm-hmm. that he was wrong on separation of church and state, because. You know, over and over again, they said, well, isn't our motto, in God we trust? Mm-hmm. Uh, doesn't our Pledge of Allegiance say we're one nation under God? On and on. 
I'd always been told that those things didn't matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, legal scholars, historians too, have used a term to describe them called ceremonial deism. Mm-hmm. It's a term that actually gets created right after that decision uh, by a Yale Law School dean, Eugene Rostow. And what they meant by that was deism, uh, the, the, the God in these um, uh, uh, national religious slogans and ceremonies is always broadly drawn. You know, it's never a reference to Jesus Christ, it's always God or the Almighty. Mm-hmm. But the ceremonial part was the really important part, because uh, what Rostow meant by that was that they were merely ornamental. But they didn't have any substance to them, they didn't matter. But what I found in those letters uh, in Hugo Black's papers was that they really did matter. It's ordinary Americans, uh, those, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance, the National Mile, they meant as much, if not more, uh, than the text of the First Amendment. So suddenly I realized I had an entirely different thread to pull on here. This, mm-hmm. this surprised me. And as, as an historian, when you get surprised in the archives, that's when you know you're on to something. <laughs> yes. uh, so, so I started to pull on that string, and, I, and it took me back into the 50s. Uh, and, and I thought, okay, well, now I'm going to tell a story about the creation of all this material, because mm-hmm. I, I was struck by how much happened in the 50s in a, in a relatively short span of time. And God we trust. Uh, it becomes uh, it gets placed on a stamp in '54, paper money in '55, becomes the national motto in '56. Under God, gets added to the pledge in '54. In these same years, you have the National Day of Prayer, the National Prayer Breakfast, on and on. So I thought, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell the story of that. Uh, but again, I, I thought I had a handle on that, uh, and as I started to dig into it, I realized uh, again that story that I'd been told, but I, but I started to, to talk about earlier that that this all was a Cold War story. I came to realize that was wrong. Hmm. So surprised again. Yeah. So I had another set of strings to follow, and it took me back into the story in the uh, in the New Deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was a process of about five years of uh, digging into the archives, being surprised, digging some more, being surprised again, uh, and only about five years into this process did I realize uh, what the book uh, was going to finally look like. I had mm-hmm. no idea when I started, <laughs> but I, I had to follow my sources, and, and this is where they took me. Well, that had to be exciting in itself. I, I, I also, I've got to ask one other kind of overarching question uh, before we dig into the, the book. Um, we know, as, as you've already mentioned, that the religious right was doing what they were doing and still are uh, very intentionally, strategically even. Um, is what you found happening in the 50s and before, was that all equally intentional, or did it just develop? You know, I always thought that a lot of what we were hearing in the 50s was a a counter-assault on communism. But when I read your book and listen to you, I get the idea there was more involved than that. It was more involved than that, but but, but in a way, it, it it is still that assault on communism. The problem is that they it was just that they saw communism coming from the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. They thought communism had already taken root here in America. Uh, uh, okay. They constantly denounced the New Deal state as a form of creeping socialism, uh, and, and it's really it's a it, it's a slippery slope in their minds between what Franklin Roosevelt is doing uh, in the 1930s and what. Stalin is doing in the 40s and 50s. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really on a continuum with them. So, so they use this language about attacking communism or creepy socialism. Uh, but if you look behind the scenes in their letters, they're quite intentional about this, uh, that what they have in mind is the New Deal, first and foremost. I see. Well, you begin with what you call the consecration of President Eisenhower. Talk about what that means. Well, I, this is one of the things that, that, that struck me uh, when I was digging into the 50s, is just how much of Eisenhower's early uh, time in office is really spent um, breathing this religious revival uh, to life. You know, we talk about uh, Franklin Roosevelt's first 100 days of the New Deal. If you look at Eisenhower's first 100 days, um, you know, Roosevelt was focused on the economy. Eisenhower spoke this on spirituality. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, really from, the, um, from his campaign, honestly, you know, he's got Billy Graham, uh, feeding them lines of scripture on the campaign trail. He talks about the 1952 race is going to be a great crusade for freedom. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he doesn't, you know, use that uh, that term lightly. And once he's in, uh, when, once he's elected, he says to Graham, "You know, I believe I was elected to lead this country on a spiritual renewal." Mm-hmm. And so he tries to do that from the very start. So the inauguration is, I, I think, as I say in the book, a uh, much more than a political ceremony; it's a religious consecration. <laughs> Uh, the very first float uh, in, the, in the inaugural parade is the one that's dedicated to the principles of, uh, of, of freedom of religion and a God we trust. Uh, the very start 
of the inaugural. Uh, you know, Eisenhower uh, that morning has a massive uh, 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 public ceremony, uh, St. John's Episcopal in D.C. Uh, he brings, you know, about uh, 150 guests come with him. The church is packed. They've announced it ahead of time. 800 people waiting outside in the morning chill uh, for this uh, this religious ceremony. And the inauguration itself was a religious ceremony in many ways. Eisenhower wrote a prayer that morning. Uh, and the very first words he gives as president are his prayer. He invokes, you know, God's blessing uh, on the administration. Mm-hmm. So from the very start, uh, and on through the early weeks and months of his administration, this is very much something at the forefront of his mind, mm-hmm. about using this new um, uh, national religion to try to bring Americans together. Kevin, am I... Uh, well, let me not, not ask you if I'm wrong or right. Let me just ask you. Um, my sense is that Eisenhower's spirituality was more general in nature than, say, uh, Bush and Obama talking specifically about Jesus and redemption and so forth. I I remember that uh, quote, not exactly from Eisenhower, where he said, everybody ought to believe in God, whatever kind of God that is. Uh, Mm -hmm. What was there a more general spirituality then, or was he just using language that people would interpret as Christian? It's a very general uh, uh, spirituality with Eisenhower. You know, he didn't belong uh, to a particular faith until after he was uh, inaugurated. Uh, Mm -hmm. February 1st, 1953, he's the only president to ever be baptized while in office. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the the faith he chooses, he he, he picks Presbyterianism um, almost offhandedly. But he does so because his wife, Mamie, is a Presbyterian. Hmm. Uh, his entire life, he'd kind of, you know, bounced mm-hmm. around from one faith to another. His, his uh, grandfather was a minister in the River Brethren. Uh, his mother had been a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, he always kind of vaguely, you know, believed in a, in a fundamentalist uh, type of religion. That's how he, he described his Christianity, hmm. uh, but never really belonged to a specific denomination. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. Eisenhower carries that kind of... Um, vague approach to religion into office. And he, he gives that famous uh, uh, line you noted in December 1952, where he says, our system of government makes no sense unless it's founded on a deeply felt religious faith, mm-hmm. and I don't care what that is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. Eisenhower's critics mock him for that. Uh, William Wee Miller at Yale University says, well, apparently the president is a very fervent believer in a very vague religion. <laughs> uh, that he's you know that he's keeping freedom as lightly, but Eisenhower, I think that was his exact point. He knew that you had to draw religion broadly in that way mm-hmm. uh, in order to welcome in uh, all types of Americans. The Americans had been divided by the faiths before: Protestants against Catholics, Christians against Jews. To say nothing of uh, minority religions like like Buddhism or, mm-hmm. or, or, or the Muslim faith, which is starting to come on on people's minds at this time. He knew that if you were going to bring Americans together around this. Um, uh, religion. Uh, it had to be vaguely drawn. It had to be that kind of again, ceremonial deism that Rostow talked about. Mm-hmm. It had to be one that would welcome in Protestants and Catholics and Jews together. But he was very intentional about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, whenever the press played up, you know, he, that he was a Presbyterian, he got angry. He, he didn't, you know, he didn't, mm-hmm. didn't want his baptism huh. uh, uh, to be publicized in the press. He, he mm-hmm. got incredibly angry uh, when the minister leaked word about it. Um, his broad ecumenical church service on the inauguration, yes, the per- should play that up. Uh, but what the fact that Eisenhower is now a Presbyterian, he did not want that stressed. He wanted a broad religion out there, again, because he thought it could unite people. Hmm. Well, uh, th- there are other, obviously, seminal turning points in this history that uh, you have written. Uh, would you highlight two or three of the others? Oh, well, sure. Uh, I think some of the, the key ones, uh, uh, maybe one before and one after, uh, uh, Eisenhower, because Eisenhower really just kind of, kind of the, uh, the pivot point of this story. Mm-hmm. Uh, before him, I told a story about the, the ways in which uh, a group of uh, conservative businessmen and sympathetic clergymen advance a language of um, what they call freedom under God. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is really the origin of a lot of the language that takes root uh, in the 50s. Um, uh, but they do so under an ideology of Christian libertarianism. And again, they're targeting uh, the New Deal. Mm-hmm. So this movement really peaks, and it's got uh, uh, ministers, uh, uh, your, your listeners have surely heard of them, uh, from Billy Graham, mm-hmm. uh, Abraham Verde, uh, but also James Fifield, a Congregationalist minister from L.A. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, they all work to advance this uh, this new sort of religious language uh, that targets the New Deal. 
Uh, and a story I like in the book uh, is um, this freedom under God ideology uh, peaks, again, the, uh, the year before Eisenhower is elected uh, with a series of Fourth of July ceremonies uh, around this theme. Uh, and there's a massive coast-to-coast campaign. They've got ministers competing in sermon contests. They have a national radio program organized by Cecil B. DeMille with Jimmy Stewart as the master of ceremonies and Lionel Barrymore and Gloria Swanson, you know, give speeches. Uh, so it's this major national event where they get this language out of the public. Um, uh, and a later one, maybe the, the, the signal would be, uh, uh, I'm drawn to the way in which uh, Nixon tries to follow Eisenhower's example. Eisenhower was very successful at using this religious language, again, I think, to bring Americans together. Uh, Nixon is, is clumsier with it. Uh, he uses it uh, to advance his own agenda. So he holds church services inside the White House, <laughs> yes, uh, with Billy Graham leading several of them, but other hand-picked ministers uh, and hand-picked congregations uh, there to hear them. Uh, and also he uses Graham to uh, to soften criticism of his uh, war in Vietnam, uh, both through a, a giant rally at the University of Tennessee uh, after the invasion of Cambodia, and then a massive, uh, to come full circle, a massive Fourth of July ceremony uh, 1970, called Honor America Day, mm. which is, again, it's, it's, a, it's a rally for the silent majority. So um, uh, Nixon's hands, this language of one nation under God that had brought people together in the 50s, uh, mm. only winds up driving them apart, because he makes this language something that becomes an identifier solely of the right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so conservatives rally around it uh, in support of the war, in support of the silent majority, and liberals uh, recoil from it. Uh, they, they retreat from this language that once brought them together. I'm talking with Dr. Kevin Cruz, author of the important new book, One Nation Under God. Uh, Kevin, it, was there, for those who were sensitive enough to see it, a particularly deceptive moment in this history that we should know about, a moment that, as I said, if we'd been looking closely, or if people then had been looking closely, would reveal just how strategic the process was that was going on? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think you can look back to that, that Freedom Under God campaign uh-huh. in 1951, because it, it gets set up as we're just trying to breathe a religious emphasis back into the celebration of the Fourth of July. Let's, let's remember that religious principles were, were, were part of us uh, from the founding, and let's celebrate that. That's how they pitched it. Mm-hmm. Uh, behind the scenes, though, um, uh, they're very clear that this language is not to celebrate the American past, but rather the change of the American future. Hmm. Uh, they are, in fact, their ads make this very clear. They're ads run by these utility companies that support this, utility companies that have been fighting the New Deal for uh, more than a decade. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they say, you know, well, let's, let's make a Declaration of Independence now, in 1951. Mm-hmm. Declare mm-hmm. your independence from the federal government. Declare that the government um, owes you no security, those, you know, survival, uh, you should be independent from that. Uh, mm-hmm. Cast off uh, this, this oppressor, just as our forefathers cast off the British crown. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in, in a way, if you look closely at it, it's very clear. Uh, and again, behind the scenes, they're very obvious about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even from those ads, it's very clear uh, that what they're doing um, was not quite what they said it was. Yeah. Well, we've talked about some of what happened on the way to uh, America becoming a so-called Christian nation in the eyes of some, uh, let's turn to the question of why. What motivated this campaign? Well, in some ways, the you know the the, the idea that America is a Christian nation is one that goes back to just after the founding generation. So, so it would have been around for a while. Uh, this particular application, though, um, uh, this invocation of that language of freedom under God mm-hmm. uh, is one that's used uh, again, as I said, to, to discredit the New Deal. That's their that's their goal, uh, and they had come to this religious language because their first try at rolling back the New Deal had failed horribly. So uh, big business uh, uh, in the early days of the, of the 1930s is publicly discredited. They're blamed for the Great Crash. The New Deal has started, uh, and, and with it, it is regulating their businesses strongly for the first time. Most, most improb- uh, problematically for them, it has empowered labor unions really for the first time. So these businesses are catching it from... Uh, above from the government and below from their own work. Uh, both are kind of um, pushing back against their authority. So they launch these economic arguments about the merits of free enterprise, uh, and they pour millions of dollars into this. The National Association of Manufacturers, for instance, uh, 
um, increases its PR budget uh, 22 times over between mm. 1934 and 1937. They are pouring money to this. Mm. The problem is no one's listening mm. because these naked appeals, these you know, uh, praising free enterprise, it doesn't work to a country that's still been rocked by the Great Depression, mm-hmm. clawing its way out of the rubble. Um, and, and it comes off as self-serving. Uh, there's one of these groups I talk about called uh, the American uh, Liberty League, uh, mm-hmm. which is funded heavily by General Motors and DuPont. Well, everyone knows it's funded by General Motors and DuPont. Mm-hmm. Um, they dismiss it accordingly. Uh, Jim Farley, the head of the Democratic Party, says, well, they ought to call the American Liberty League the American Cellophane League. Mm-hmm. Because, number one, uh, everyone knows it's, it's a DuPont product. And number two, you can see right through it. Hmm. So they quickly decide that this, this you know, appeal to free enterprise on its own terms isn't working. So what, how can we pitch business, they say? Well, who are the most trusted people in America? Well, polls show the most trusted people in America right now are ministers. So let's get ministers to make this argument for us. And that's where this language about freedom under God comes about. So, and I don't want to make this too simplistic, but there was an economic motive uh, pushing this, but it w- that was being pushed to people who were thinking more about the language of the movement and thinking more about that as an affirmation of their religion r- rather than an affirmation of one kind of economy. That's right. Well, what they do is they, is they link capitalism and Christianity. Yeah. Uh, and, and they link them together by saying um, it's a simplistic version of Christianity, but uh, you know, they say, you know, Christianity, you rise and fall on your own merits. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, the, the good go to heaven, the bad go to hell. Yeah. In capitalism, you rise and fall on your own merits, the good make a profit, the bad go to the poorhouse. And they say, well, any system that interferes with that divinely prescribed order of things um, is, is corrupt. In fact, it is pagan statism. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what they do is they... They tell ministers, and they tell um, uh, the congregations of these ministers and uh, through them, that this New Deal isn't just restricting the rights of businessmen. If it's doing that, it's restricting the rights of individuals across the board, and that also then restricts religious freedom. Mm-hmm. So they made the New Deal not uh, just a, uh, and what conservatives have seen as a threat to their economic liberty, they made it into a, a menace to religious liberty as well. Mm-hmm. And that motivates people who wouldn't have cared one way or another about what happens to General Motors. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's going to happen to, say, the Methodist Church, now we care. So who got hurt the most by this Christianization of history methodology? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I'd say, actually, I mean, in some ways religious liberals do. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, at, at first, they don't, we don't quite mind this. Um, uh, they're, you know, they're celebrating a general return to religion. There's a religious revival that I think this fuels in the 1950s. Uh, and they're happy about that. Uh, but then this religious language quickly becomes co-opted by the right, um, and they find themselves marginalized. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't quite have uh, the political power from the 50s on, uh, and, and, and most importantly, the financial backing um, uh, that, that the right has um, in using this language. And so what you get is... A movement that really uses this religious language, uh, ironically, to to trump the social gospel, mm-hmm. uh, to 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 really sideline any idea that uh, there's a liberal version uh, of religion that manifests itself in our politics. Now, uh, others would, you know, use this language to advance liberalism. You know, I think Martin Luther King does this quite well. Mm-hmm. He uses this language about you know, uh, one nation under God to uh, to advance the cause of civil rights. But on the economic side, I think it, it really falls away. I think they might be the big losers here. Yeah. Do, do you see uh, these same principles and campaigns influencing our culture and politics today? I think they do. Uh, I think they've largely been divorced from their their economic origin. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, happens to Eisenhower's time on. Um, but these these mottos, you only have to Google them. Uh, right now, you know, you'll see, one nation under God and God we trust are Mm-hmm. invoked by the Tea Party or invoked by members of the religious right um, for for different ends than they've been intended. Mm-hmm. But once that language gets um, gets established, once you have that fusion of kind of piety and patriotism in the 1950s, uh, it becomes a touchstone that gets used by a, a variety of, uh, of conservative movements uh, to this very day. You know, I, I uh, 
that brings me back to something that I asked you early on about the generalities involved in uh, Eisenhower's spirituality and the more specific Christian content uh, that we hear now from the religious right. Um, I, I th- it, it seemed to me that early on we were having a, a strong affirmation of religion. What we're hearing right now even in the presidential primaries uh, for the next presidential uh, election, is not a general spirituality. and in, in fact, that's often kind of mocked or being put down. These people are serious only about Christianity. I think that's right. I think, you know, in, in their, uh, sometimes they may make a, you know, a reference to that broad Judeo-Christian tradition, but but it really has become, um, I think, much more of a narrowly defined uh, Christianity, and a particular version of that, too. I think it's a very um, both theologically and politically conservative version of Christianity that we're seeing. Um, and that may be the fact that right now they're talking to, you know, Republican primary voters who are more attuned to hear that. We might see a pivot in the general election, perhaps, uh, mm-hmm. depending on who the candidate is. Uh, but I think you're absolutely right that right now that's that's what we're seeing. Uh, do you see the religious right, whether or not they're aware of it, using some of the same techniques that were used in the historical period that you wrote about? I think to some extent, yes. Uh, again, this 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 general sense of an invention of a religious founding, mm-hmm. um, I, I think it's still alive and well. Uh, that's something that the people I talk about in the book try to communicate, this constant move to uh, recruit the founders uh, behind this idea that America is a religious nation. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it takes a, a bit of imagination, I think. I think if you look at what the founding generation said, they're they're quite clear on this. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so these people, um, much like the religious right today, they often go back to the Declaration of Independence, that's invocation of nature's God, or that rights come from our Creator. Mm-hmm. Uh, they tend to ignore the Constitution, which purposely keeps uh, religion and the state at arm's length from one another. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they they ignore the Treaty of Tripoli, which you know, mm-hmm. uh, a treaty created by Washington, signed by Adams, ratified by a Senate that was still half full of signers of the Constitution, and ratified unanimously. And that treaty says, "quote unquote," the government of the United States is in no sense founded on the Christian religion. Mm-hmm. Um, so the founders were quite clear on this, but there's a desire um, on the part of the people I talk about in the book, and I think uh, on the religious right today, uh, to instead twist it so that the founders. Uh, would have been strongly in favor of this, when the the, the record, I think, uh, suggests quite clearly, as diverse as they were, but on this issue, they were of one mind. Yeah, well, of course, that that is history, but uh, it's not good strategy for <laughs> what right. some people are talking about. I'm curious as to what kind of response you've received uh, related to your book. Uh, so, so far, it's been, it's been quite nice. I, I kind of was braced for, uh, and it may, it may still be coming, knock on wood, uh, but I was braced for kind of a a serious pushback, but I've been kind of delighted at the uh, the response. Um, and, and what's amazing to me is that uh, disparate groups that you might not think uh, would get along on this uh, uh, have have really um, been very supportive of the book. So, um, you know, secular groups, uh, atheists, agnostics, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, they love the book, I think, yeah, they, yeah. It, it pushes back against that mythology. But um, I'm really heartened by um, religious liberals uh, and moderates have, I think, really embraced yeah. this book because it it changes some of the uh, uh, some of the political terrain for them, uh, and it highlights some of the problems uh, with this religious right embrace of this old narrative. Because um, mm-hmm. religious liberals in the book push back against this language, and I think hmm. now they see that there's a long history on their side, mm-hmm. which um, uh, which can be alive and well in their own time. Kevin, uh, what did writing the book do to you? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, that's a great question. I, don't know, I mean, I think it made me think not just about my nation's history in a way I hadn't thought about before. Um, it made me think about my own faith in some ways. Uh-huh. I'm Catholic. Uh, and, you know, it's been a, uh, in the decade I wrote this book, um, the Catholic Church has undergone uh, uh, some, some downs, and, uh-huh. and I think recently some ups. Uh, and it's made me think about... Um, uh, the changing nature, not just of our nation's uh, politics, uh, but the, the different faiths that uh, that make up the, the nation's people. 
yeah. uh, and, and what's going on in, in my own life, in my own church, and what's going on in, in those of others. It's, it's, uh, it's given me a lot of uh, uh, cause to reflect. A succinct answer on this one would be good. If there's one thing you want a reader to take away from this book, what would it be? Our traditions are what we make of them. And so, uh, you know, we don't need to adhere to things just because that's the way they've always been done. Uh, But I think we need to know their history, for better or worse. Dr. Kevin Cruz is the author of the important new book, One Nation Under God, How Corporate America Invented Christian America. A prolific author, Dr. Cruz is professor of history at Princeton University. He's also a member of the executive committee of the Center for the Study of Religion, uh, Kevin, I have seldom say this to our listeners, but I say it every once in a while. Th- this is one of those rare books that if you have to sell your shirt to go buy, you need to sell your shirt and go buy it. Uh, wow. it, it, uh, it can really change the way we look at a whole range of assumptions about the present and the past of our culture and our nation. Uh, this has been, for me, a very... Uh, fun interview as well as enlightening interview, and I really appreciate you being with us today on State of Belief Radio. It was absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.